By the early 20th century, film had become the medium of record. If an event wasn't filmed, it was as if it never happened. But in China, it was difficult to first document and then preserve the film record of a country in turmoil. There was the collapse of the Qing Dynasty and the rise and fall of a republic, the emergence of so-called warlord generals, the founding of a second republic, civil war, an invasion that would rage for 14 years, destroying much of China and taking millions of lives, a renewed civil war and revolution, all in the span of 50 years. Now, after decades of research, it is finally possible to see life in China as it actually occurred. To see China frame by frame. My name is Bill Einreinhofer, and I doubt you've ever heard of me, despite a 40 plus year career in television. I started making documentaries back when I was in college, which obviously was a long time ago. I've spent most of my career behind the camera until now. When I first arrived in China, more than three decades ago, I had no idea I would spend much of my professional career making stories in and about China. I also didn't know I would become a footage detective, spending countless hours locating rare historic footage. Yet, that's what happened. Today, America and China have deep, fundamental differences. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say relations are terrible and threaten to get even worse. How did we reach this point? The answer to that question can, in part, be found in historic film footage, much of which was lost, stolen, or at the very least, misplaced for decades. Footage I have been tracking down for more than 30 years. These are some of the earliest film images to be shot in China. Who are these people? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? Where are they going? What kind of inner life do they live? We don't know. We will never know. Foreigners shot most of the footage from this era. They likely didn't speak or write Chinese and had a limited understanding of the local culture. Yet it is still possible to recognize authentic elements of Chinese life. Even if those films are sometimes mischaracterized the events, you can find some valuable things in that. It was the rare foreign film that captured Chinese life as it was, life that ebbed and flowed just as it did in other societies, events that mirrored the emotional lives of the Chinese people themselves, as opposed to what Westerners saw as strange and exotic. Yet, foreigners didn't have a complete monopoly when it came to filmmaking. This is a group of United States Marine Corps pilots flying over the port city of Tianjin in North China during the 1920s. The subject matter alone makes this footage notable, but so does the cameraman. We don't know who he is, but he must have been good. Would the Marines have chosen someone who wasn't proficient to document their exploits? In China, the period from the mid 19th century until the mid 20th century is known as the century of humiliation. The dangers posed by invasion, occupation and rebellion were seen as perpetual threats by China's leaders. Over its history, China has been invaded from many directions by many people, and this has made it suspicious to foreigners. Also, China is a country of diverse provinces and ethnic minorities, some of which had rebelled in earlier times. The Chinese Communist Party is obsessed with the image of a unified China, and it represses any thoughts of separatism. During the first half of the 20th century, thousands of foreign children 
The sons and daughters of business executives, doctors, lawyers, Christian missionaries, and others lived in China. China, in fact, was their home. We learned to speak Chinese, and we, we were completely bilingual as children. If we played with our brothers and sisters, we also had Chinese playmates, and the, there were more Chinese around us than there were Americans. And of course, we ate Chinese food, and it was just all a part of our life. Grandpa was there in the 1890s. He started helping put in the railroads in China. And uh, then my father got involved with the coal mines in China, with a big British Chinese uh, coal mining consortium, the Kailan. I was born over there in Honan. Life in China during the first half of the 20th century was harsh. Poverty, hunger, disease, and an early death awaited many Chinese. Even in Shanghai, China's largest, most prosperous city. They collect all the death bodies from the poor people because it's very cold and they were died because of the cold. Huh? They collect them every day, six o'clock in the morning. I saw it with my own eyes. And I saw it also with my own eyes. That's uh, quite, a, quite a lot, not very few people on the street try to sell their children and just write a note. Who can help my kids? Who wants my kids? Key to every issue, to every humiliation, was the principle of sovereignty. The Chinese people had little say in, and less control of, events taking place in their own country. During the early part of the 20th century, most foreigners and Chinese lived in parallel worlds, worlds that seldom mixed. The difference between those two worlds was stunning. Yet Ronald Morris and his cousin Mike lived in both cultures. And I remember my grandmother scolding me a couple of times and that because I wouldn't eat the food that we had. I preferred the food downstairs with the Chinese, the kids, and all. I'd sit down and eat with them, which they graciously gave me. But my mom, grandmother, wound up just giving them extra money for payment for uh, the food. But that, so really, I love Chinese chow. That's it. 1930s Shanghai was home to a large number of stateless Jewish exiles. Many had found shelter in China from Russia's Bolshevik Revolution. Later, refugees from war-torn Europe fleeing the Holocaust would arrive. Lillian Willens and her parents lived in a part of Shanghai called the French Concession, an area that, decades later, still has a special, even romantic quality. Well, the French Concession was the residential section of Shanghai, and um, it was very much like a French little small city out there. The stores were actually Russian-owned stores, People spoke Russian in the streets, or you spoke English, and the Chinese spoke to us in pidgin English. The language in Shanghai was British English. As I always mention it, language always follows trade. In old Shanghai, the Chinese did most of the work, while the foreigners made the money. Some amassed absolute fortunes, living lives of luxury, unimaginable back home. The United States, Great Britain, France, and Japan all maintained a permanent military presence in China. Men serving in the US Navy's Yangtze Patrol, dubbed China sailors, could live the good life despite their meager pay. Many never went home. The Wangpo River from Amoy, sampans from Suzhou, and 
plenty of sampans for sailors bound for a liberty in Shanghai. China has its full quota of pretty girls who combine oriental charm with modern snap. The result is not hard to look at. It would be a mistake to judge all foreigners living in China harshly. Many were committed to saving souls and saving lives, like those who served at a Presbyterian mission in a northern Chinese town, then called Weixian. In a place of desperate poverty, proper medical care was the difference between life and death. There were even holidays which might be called Christmas with Chinese characteristics. Thomas Dunn was a physician, as well as a leader in Shanghai's American community. He'd been in the Navy in the First World War and just got interested in China and thought he'd just spend a couple of years there before going back to California, which is where he was from. But he liked it so much that my mother, whom he'd known in college, he, she came out and they were married in the Philippines and then moved to Shanghai, where he set up practice and was very, very busy doctor and a very sweet man, so he had a lot of patients, a lot of patients. Whatever advantages foreigners enjoyed, wealth, status, servants, they still succumbed to the same endemic diseases that killed millions of Chinese. They ended their days in a special foreigner section of one of Shanghai's largest cemeteries. Today, their graves are seldom, if ever, visited. So-called newsreels, short films usually shown in theaters, were the only way to actually see the news before the arrival of television. Often sensational, the newsreels told stories with what today might be called attitude. They also exhibited a kind of casual racism, slurs, insults, paternalism, that is astounding by today's standards. Arriving in modern steam freighters, the cars are swung into waiting river junks, among the oldest type of boats known to man. There seems to be no great rush. The coolies are philosophical about it all. This isn't the regular assembly line. The Chinese very courteously insisted on bringing their work out of doors, so we'd be sure they had nothing up their sleeve. Look, a sale already. Another satisfied V8 owner. When China's last imperial dynasty, the Qing dynasty, collapsed in 1911, the country was plunged into chaos. It saw the rise of what the West termed warlords. Regional leaders with their own armies, hungry for personal power. Sun Yat-sen, the founder of the Guomindang, or Nationalist Party, didn't live long enough to see it come to power. His successor, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, participated in a united front effort with China's then small Communist Party. One of its members was a former college librarian named Mao Zedong. But in 1927, Chiang Kai-shek violently ended the united front, ordering the execution of thousands of communists. Years later, the communists would take revenge on rural landlords and so-called rich peasants. In September 1931, the Imperial Japanese Army occupied three provinces in Northeast China, an area often called Manchuria. An incident was staged as an excuse for a massive Japanese military invasion this is the, the time that the Japanese were very worried about a number of things, uh, including the sustainability of the Japanese empire. They were worried about shortages, shortages in oil, in other sorts of supplies. They were also worried about the fact that they have too many people. They needed new space, especially for their farmers to live. And they had been competing with China as well as the Soviet Union for influence in Manchuria. And Manchuria was the most industrialized part of continental East Asia. Uh, and so they wanted to move in there. During January 1932, the Imperial Japanese Navy 
sent troops ashore in Shanghai, allegedly to protect Japanese economic interests and civilians. Chiang Kai-shek largely avoided confronting the Japanese troops, who were occupying ever more territory in China, concentrating instead on his communist rivals. Not until he was kidnapped in 1936 and facing death would he agree to a second united front with a now larger but still relatively small Communist Party. The stage was set for China to finally confront the Japanese invaders. So the arrival of war in Shanghai was sudden and deadly. We lived about a half a mile from the railroad, and the Japanese are periodically trying to bomb the railroad. So as a child, I can remember that awful sound of a plane you know, diving. Nowadays, they just drop it, but in those days, they, they dove in. And we had a, a porch in our house on the third floor. We used to have tea in the afternoon. And one time, we saw this plane was coming in, dive bombing, and my governess said, come on, we got to go inside. But I was dragging my feet, and I looked up, and here I could see the pilot in the plane. He dropped the bombs on the railroad. There was a lot of slaughter. My cousin Mike and I, uh, we, uh, we were scared to death. We saw a lot of... A lot of bad. We, we, we saw a lot of hunger. We saw, saw the Chinese wrapped around a tree, eating the bark off the tree, you know. They were being bayoneted. Children being bayoneted. Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. China's soldiers were brave, but courage alone could not stop Japanese tanks nor the Japanese aircraft that bombed largely defenseless Chinese cities. When the Battle of Shanghai was over, much of the central city, as well as many outlying districts, were in ruins. When we went there, I was shocked to see buildings broken, everything was broken down, shattered, and people in the streets. So uh, there was a little store, and I saw a gleaming white bicycle, and I told my father, I'm going to take it. He said, absolutely not. Someone, it owned someone by someone, and uh, the person could have been killed. And I think then I realized what death meant. I was 10 years old. Chiang Kai-shek unsuccessfully fought a conventional war against the Japanese military. China's soldiers were often hindered by poor strategy and inferior equipment. Mao Zedong and the communist forces chose a completely different strategy. They used what today is commonly called asymmetric warfare. Mao's guerrilla warfare is not just, you know, small units taking on, sort of having pot shots at Japanese policemen and installations. No, no, it's much more sophisticated. It is going into the rear of the Japanese, building up these base areas with new government, new laws, sometimes new currencies, sustaining a Red Army, uh, Eighth Route Army as it's called at this time, that can operate outside of the base, but also local guerrilla forces, local uh, militia, uh, and sort of middle-level units that can operate throughout that base area. It is impossible to overemphasize the impact of Japan's military occupation. Millions of people fled to Western China. Every family has a story. It is how Beijing-based journalist Melinda Liu's father met his future wife. He and my mother, um, they actually were both at Tsinghua University. 
Um, because the Japanese occupied Beijing, the univers that university, as well as a, a number of other Chinese universities, in a very dramatic and, and sort of romantic episode, the entire student body, the professors, the laboratories, the books, the libraries, the classrooms, they all tried to relocate west to get away from the Japanese. This footage, unseen in America or China for decades, is unique. Under the terms of the United Front Agreement, the Communist Party was allowed to maintain a presence in China's wartime capital, then called Chongqing. Zhou Enlai, Mao Zedong's trusted lieutenant, was in overall charge. Workers wrote, printed, and assembled the communist newspaper Xinhua Daily, an act which could get them arrested or even killed elsewhere in China. They worked under the watchful gaze of American President Franklin Roosevelt and Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin. Children attended classes in a school unlike any other in nationalist or Japanese-controlled China, a school with a communist course of study. Security forces cleaned their weapons, preparing for a possible attack, not by Japanese soldiers, but their erstwhile nationalist allies, just as took place in 1927. And who knew that revolutionaries enjoyed playing basketball? During the 1930s and 1940s, the Imperial Japanese government ceaselessly turned out propaganda films, newsreels, and feature films aimed at Japanese, Chinese, and global audiences. Their goal was to paint a picture of an imaginary world that never existed. It included documentaries about how wonderful life was in the mythical country of Manchukuo, which in fact was the large area in northeast China Japan invaded in 1931. A Japanese feature film included scenes of selfless Japanese soldiers feeding hungry Chinese refugees, protecting them from murderous Chinese troops, the exact opposite of what actually happened. English language presentations were aimed at convincing American audiences that only benevolent Japanese rulers could administer a fractious and fractured China. Hungry children soon learned that other big children from over the sea would give them some of their rice or even sweets if they asked for it. While long rows of peasants waited, basket in hand, old granny would get her cigarette too. What was missing was any discussion of the Japanese military's use of rape, terror, arson, looting, and murder. Even chemical and biological warfare, similar to Nazi atrocities in Europe. The conflict traumatized millions of Chinese children who made toys reflecting the world they saw every day, a world at war. The Imperial Japanese Navy's attack on America's base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, changed everything. Now China and the United States were officially allies, and American forces could openly attack Japanese military targets, replacing covert operations like the Flying Tigers. But American, British, Australian, and Dutch civilians living in Japanese-occupied China became enemy nationals. Entire families were sent to civilian prison camps. Well, the food was terrible, fish, rice, and cabbage, or slimy cabbage, rotten fish, and rice filled with beet bull weevils and stones because it was off of shavings from warehouses. Um, and they had to, finally the doctor said, don't take, take out the stones, but don't take out the bull weevils because that is, they are cooked and that is protein. So you learn to eat what you had to eat. As badly as the Japanese military treated foreigners in the internment camps, it paled in comparison to what the Chinese people experienced. Millions of Chinese, many innocent civilians, would die as a result of tactics 
that eventually were summarized as the three alls. Kill all, burn all, loot all. On July 4th, 1943, Independence Day in the United States, American children at one internment camp joined their parents in singing patriotic songs. We had to sing the Star Spangled Banner. And the Japanese rushed in and <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The Japanese rushed in and said, you can't sing that song. So we were all sent back to our buildings and said, you can't stay here, no more singing. And as I got to the door of my room, I turned and, <laughs> and you could hear those last streams. Home of the brave, home of the free. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was just a very emotional thing for me. I apologize. There was a rumble that we were going to be executed and uh, some uh, stakes were being driven into the roll call field. I thought it was a big fat joke. I, I had no idea and I didn't find out later on that that was a possibility. But thank goodness we were liberated. Otherwise we would have been executed, that's true. August 1945, Japanese military forces surrender in China. It was sudden, unexpected, and complete. In China, leaflets announcing victory were organized into bundles to be dropped by American aircraft over major cities. The news literally fell from the sky. In Shanghai, there was a parade. With the fighting over, China could finally enjoy the benefits of peace. The fighting had ended, or had it. Many Chinese felt it wasn't just Japanese troops who should leave China. They wanted all foreign military units to exit, including thousands of American troops. I always see my own eyes, the military ships from American and Britain on the river of Pu Huangpu and the, on the streets, always the navies and the MPs. I said, so I said, why the Japanese have left us? And why you come here? What for? And it's then me, I, I, I asked me why. Then I said, this is our fatherland. This is my own land. I, we do not need other help. General George C. Marshall the recently retired U.S. Army Chief of Staff was sent to China to negotiate the establishment of a coalition government incorporating both the nationalists as well as the communists. According to American newsreels, Marshall was able to do the impossible, brokering a ceasefire between the communists and the nationalists, ending China's civil war. Those newsreels were wrong. With the initial support of the Soviets, the Chinese Communist Party gradually gained the ability to wage guerrilla war against the government of Chiang Kai-shek. After Japan's surrender, the U.S. attempted to reconcile the parties, but Mao's support amongst the peasants had grown and his demand to share power went far beyond what Chiang could accept. Therefore, China's civil war resumed. The Soviet Union, in the final days of the war, had occupied Northeast China. And besides putting their own imprint on the region, all of the military equipment surrendered by the Japanese was given to the communist forces. On paper, the KMT, the nationalists, looked unbeatable. In fact, the CPC, the communists, were stronger. Chiang Kai-shek had lost the faith of the Chinese people. Since 1937, a scorched earth policy condemned the vast majority of the Chinese people who could not follow the retreating KMT troops to live in a ruined wasteland. As many as 900,000 Chinese died in 1938 when Chiang Kai-shek had dikes holding back the Yellow River destroyed hoping it would stop oncoming Japanese troops. It only delayed them. By 1946, China was in political and economic chaos. 
there was triple-digit inflation. Only the black market merchants seemed to be making money. As the months went by, nationalist forces were repeatedly defeated. Battered and demoralized, eventually most were in full retreat, often abandoning their heavy weapons and equipment. Even more critical, it was now clear that Chiang Kai-shek was a terrible general. His chief opponent, communist general Lin Biao, had been brilliant in the fight against Japanese forces. General Lin Biao is one of the greatest commanders of World War II, not just in China, but around the world. He was a great tactician, uh, a great leader of men, obviously, and he would uh, defeat the nationalists later on during the civil war uh, in Manchuria. Uh, and then he, I, I think it's absolutely amazing, he took his forces all the way from Manchuria through China and ended up in Hainan. In October 1949, a new country was born, the People's Republic of China. In the spring of 1972, American President Richard Nixon arrived in China the entire world took notice. About 20 years later, I arrived in China for the first of many visits. It wasn't big news. Much of what I knew about China came from TV news reports and documentaries about what was always called Red China. Often, it was hard to know what was going on, let alone why it was happening. Of course, the CIA wasn't having much luck either. I had no idea that there wasn't a single Chinese cuisine, but many, none of which included things like chop suey and fortune cookies. Just like an early 20th century foreign cameraman, initially, I shot footage of anything and anyone, even when I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at. But gradually, I began to work it out. Or, more accurately, the local production people I worked with explained things to me. And that is how I truly discovered China. In 1989, some places in Beijing seemed much like they are today, but the people in those places certainly dressed differently. Beijing didn't look like the capital city of a global power. In fact, it was decidedly low-tech. There were buses, but few cars. Yet change was taking place. The impact of sweeping regulatory changes collectively known as reform and opening, were just becoming visible. That included tentative first steps in a gradual shift away from state economic planning towards a more demand-driven, consumer-based economy. This woman was selling what was one of China's first truly national brands, Wawa ice cream. Wawa ice cream is um, it is very special, not because of the taste, but also because of the shape. Wawa ice cream is designed like um, um, the Wawa face. Wawa in Chi Chinese means the baby. So we could imagine it's like a baby face with a hat on it. It has the chocolate taste of the hat because it's chocolate and the vanilla taste of the face. So every kid will like it. It was China's then little known space program, not ice cream, that brought me to Beijing in the late 1980s. At that point, no American TV journalist had been granted access to key space facilities and personnel. The roots of China's space program dated back to fears of America and its atomic bombs. At one time, China and the Soviet Union were allies, with the Soviets promising to help China. So, in a remote desert area in western China, 
the Chinese began to build their own rocket research and test facilities. The test site was created largely with people power, not heavy equipment. Following the Sino-Soviet split, the Chinese were on their own. They built what became China's first rocket launch facility. China's first launch vehicles were modified military rockets. It was the same approach used by the United States. The Long March series of rockets continues to power China's space program today. The use of satellites to link together the vast Chinese nation was viewed as an essential element in the country's modernization efforts. Soon, people in even the most remote areas could see programs broadcast from China Central Television's production facility in Beijing. China's initial foray into remote sensing satellites involved becoming a participant in America's Landsat program, which uses satellites to monitor critical environmental and developmental trends from space. While it is true that some of the images downloaded and processed, such as those of Taiwan, might have potential military applications, in 1989, I was assured the facility was strictly focused on economic applications. There is a lot of end users. Someone from the ministry, Ministry of Petroleum, Ministry of uh, Meteorology, they use the data to locate the oil deposit or metal deposit. Some users from the Ministry of Forestry and the Ministry of Agriculture, they use to see how the crops is growing and how is the, the forest. Uh -huh. You know, especially in 1987, there was a great, huge uh, forest fire in, in the northeast of China. And uh, we use Lancet data moni to monitor the fire. Even in the 1980s, China was already thinking about launching men and women into space. Although at that point, research was at its most basic levels. The Institute of Space Medicine and Engineering was charged with the selection and training of what in China are called taikonauts. The development of a spacesuit and the study of medical issues were already underway. Even though no decision had been made about when to send someone into space. Because uh, the manned space flight program is a, like a very big project. So it has uh, decided by many factors and uh, de decided by the high, highest level leaders. While China was reaching out into space, back on Earth, equally surprising changes were taking place. New private enterprises were emerging. Often, they were led by self-educated executives who practiced modern business management. A sharp departure from the policies followed in China since 1949. After Mao's death in 1976, Deng Xiaoping emerged as China's new leader. He established reforms to attract foreign businesses and open China to trade. He also sent Chinese students abroad to learn the skills that would modernize China. More importantly, Deng succeeded in changing his people's attitude towards business under a new economic approach he termed socialism with Chinese characteristics. The timing was especially right because globalism was just beginning. Every year, Qingdao, a port city in northeast China, holds a festival celebrating their most famous product, Qingdao beer. The brand still uses the pre-1949 spelling of the city's name. 
But one thing that has changed is the way the company is run. For decades, it was a typical state-owned enterprise. As a company, its leaders, its management team, its management team, its management team, has been faced with one company. 那就是国家。现在呢，我们面对的是所有的股东，所以呢，这就决定了这个企业的管理团队在决策重大事情的时候，的出发点发生了很大的变化。他要站在全体股东的角度上去思考问题，或者说，从全体股东的利益出发来决策事务。It's a Saturday in early 1994, and this scene is being repeated in tens of thousands of shops and stores throughout China. It's an activity perhaps best characterized by that classic American phrase, shop till you drop. In the decades before, store shelves were often empty. Prior to 1949, only the affluent could afford to shop here. No more. China's department stores had been liberated. By the 1990s, an emphasis on market forces supplemented, but never totally replaced, central planning. For many who grew up then, it was a time of optimism in China. It was an era of ambitious dreams. A new generation was experiencing lives very different from those of their parents and grandparents, who had confronted sacrifice and hunger. They were also the center of attention, as most families were allowed only one child. It was during celebrations of Lunar New Year, or Spring Festival, as it is called in China, that these generational differences were most apparent. It's Ganshu 小孩子就会在这边跑来跑去，然后都感受到那些大人每一年一度聚集起来的那种快乐。When I was a kid, because of the one-child policy, I am the only child in my family, and obviously, I got a lot of attention from my parents and grandparents, which is nice. They always feed me the great food, what they like, and always. Asked me to eat this, eat that, the tons of food I've eaten. So that's why I was like a little chubby at that time. <laughs> the 1990s saw the introduction of something entirely new in China the twin concepts of leisure time and retirement. Millions of Chinese now had free time, something unthinkable in the past. And they had the financial resources necessary to splurge on non-essentials, which then became essentials, like a family car. Shanghai Volkswagen is a joint venture company set up by the Shanghai city government and Volkswagen AG of Germany. In the 1990s, its main assembly line churned out a model known as the Santana. And at least in TV commercials, it was emblematic of a new lifestyle. Working in China, I found myself playing a wide range of roles. I covered the news, like a public service campaign, encouraging parents to teach their children how to swim. Other times, I was the news, for reasons that weren't always clear. But there certainly were times when I felt very uneasy. The People's Liberation Army Air Force Museum includes exhibits that look similar to its American counterparts. Only here, America is the enemy. During the Korean War, 
American pilots painted red stars on their aircraft for each Chinese plane shot down. The Chinese did the same for each American killed. That has a special meaning to me, given my nephew is an American fighter pilot. Yet, I also saw former Chinese Air Force pilots training for an entirely new mission as commercial airline pilots. These days, there is no shortage of glamour throughout China. But not everyone gets to go to the party. Millions of migrant workers powered China's economic miracle. They streamed into China's coastal cities, lured by salaries far above anything they could ever earn in the countryside. But they pay an emotional price for this prosperity. Many can only go back to their home villages once a year for spring festival. Only then can they briefly see their families. On the eve of the Lunar New Year, believers from throughout Shanghai gather at the Longhua Buddhist Temple to make offerings to the temple's deities. These people are here to burn the first incense of the new year. Many of these believers are the same people who are helping to power China's economic modernization. Like Shanghai itself, they are rooted in history, yet forever changing. Outside, migrants who live in Shanghai but can't afford to enter the temple offer their own prayers. Inside, those wealthy enough to make large contributions are allowed to ring the sacred temple bell. China doesn't have a single past. Rather, there are multiple pasts. Israeli photographer Devir Bargal leads what is probably Shanghai's most unique tour. He takes visitors to sites associated with a now all but vanished Jewish Shanghai. Despite the threat posed by the rise of Nazi Germany, nations around the world closed their doors to Jewish refugees. Shanghai was one of the few places where those fleeing the Holocaust were welcome. An estimated 20,000 people were given refuge. During what was called the Cultural Revolution, which occurred from the mid-1960s until the mid-1970s, anything old was considered bad. The headstones and grave markers of foreigners were presumed destroyed. But that turned out not always to be the case. Slowly, many Jewish grave markers were retrieved. When I come to Shanghai five years ago, I heard an antique shop in Shanghai selling uh, Jewish graves. And in the Jewish world, we really care about our ancestors' uh, grave uh, places. And also in the villages, when I went, I went to pick up these headstones, this particular headstone was on the floor in the, in the entry of a house. While at that time, first time I saw it, the owner did not want to give me this headstone. But then start to convince him, to start to explain to him how important it is to bring it back to the city, eventually understood, and we became a very good friend. Most of the foreigners who lived in China left by 1949. Those who later returned were amazed. I was quite taken aback when I finally decided to go there. There were no more beggars. There was no poverty in the streets. They may be poorly dressed. That was uh, 1990, if I have to calculate the date. And uh, I was quite amazed because when I left China, there was nothing, absolutely. Poverty, uh, beggars, uh, no industry, nothing. And then when I went back repeatedly, I was taken aback completely. 100-story buildings, the uh, uh, highest I had ever seen was 20 stories in Shanghai. Century-old homes and businesses are making way for new development. 
Even relatively young Chinese men and women sometimes experience a sense of nostalgia as their hometowns continue changing. In a China where most families didn't have a refrigerator and there weren't any supermarkets, visits to markets like this in the East China city of Wuxi were a daily ritual. These markets still exist, of course, but they no longer play a central role in the lives of most city dwellers who value the convenience uniformity, and brand names found at supermarkets. Foreigners, including myself, tend to romanticize old China. The fact is, life was incredibly difficult, especially for the vast majority of the Chinese people. There is little romantic about homes lacking central heating, air conditioning, or reliable plumbing. Yet, residents have an emotional bond with both their neighbors and their neighborhoods. Even among the so-called privileged foreigners, many of whom have revisited China, some memories are bittersweet. I can still hear those, those planes. And I can still hear the bombing. To this day, I don't like lightning and thunder. My husband said, why are you so scared of lightning and thunder when you're not scared of anything else? And I said, we talked about it and finally decided it was just left over from the war and having, you know, the city was bombed later by the Japanese and just hearing that bombs go off and then the flash of light and the sound still is with me still to this day. And I really curl up and I just don't want anything to do with thunder or lightning. Just don't like it at all. And it's silly. I know it's silly, but, you know, there it is. Can't change it. I feel like a man without a country, you know, because China is where I was born. My nationality, my inheritance was my father being American. I'm an American. America is my, my inheritance. It just doesn't feel like it's my birthplace. And yet China is my birthplace, but I'm definitely not a Chinese. And this kind of loses me. My mind thinks that way. I'm lost. Where am I from? China is a part of my life. I was born there. The very first time I went back to China after I grew up, when I got to the Beijing airport, I got down on my knees and I kissed the ground because I said, this is my mother, and I kissed my mother. And I do miss China because I'm American, but that is part of who Mary Taylor Previty is. The pace and the scale of the dramatic changes China has experienced over the past three decades are nothing short of astounding. But some things do endure, like the hopes and dreams Chinese parents had for their children in the past that continue to thrive today. Shanghai, 人文，然后能够把它和自己成长时候所接收到的一些文化习惯都能够联系在一起。There was a time in China when it was uncertain if children would even survive until adulthood. Now many Chinese parents 
believe their children will be able to enjoy both material success and emotional fulfillment. But there are no guarantees. Just to be clear, I don't claim to be an expert on China. I don't speak Mandarin. I can't read the Chinese characters on my own business cards. And while I have an understanding of China's past, I can't make any predictions about its future. Still, over the course of more than 30 years, I have interviewed countless people in and about China. Many were kind enough to share their personal stories with me. When I travel through China, I often have other people's memories in my head. Sadly, many of those people are gone, but their stories live on through me. And now they live on through you as well. Thank you. Cheers.